All right, here is your study guide for AP Bio. The exam covers chapter seven, eight, and nine. Here is your exam breakdown um, for chapter seven, which is mitosis and meiosis. There's gonna be 13 multiple choice on that. Um, for genetics, which is chapter eight, and pedigrees, there's 11 multiple choice. And then for everything else, DNA, replication, and protein synthesis, there's also 11 multiple choice. There's five short answer, which we'll go over. And there's one essay, which I gave you the four choices. All right, so the first topic that you need to know for Chapter 7 is to know what happens during interphase. Interphase happens during mitosis and meiosis, um, before mitosis and meiosis. So there's three parts, basically, for interphase. You have G1, S, and G2. For G1, um, that's when the cell is growing. For S, that's when the DNA is being replicated, DNA replication. And just keep in mind that all other cell materials are also getting copied. And then in G2, they're preparing for cell division. Um, from our lab, we know that um, interphase is the longest phase. And there's a picture of what interphase should look like. You should see chromatin as the form of the chromosome. And then also the nuclear membrane or nuclear envelope is visible along with the nucleolus. Um, and just remember that this is before mitosis or meiosis begins. All right, next thing you need to know are the characteristics of mitosis, which is PMAT, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. I gave you a picture there. Um, there's four phases of mitosis. Remember, interphase is not mitosis. For prophase, you can see in the picture that the chromosomes are visible, which means that that chromatin that was in interphase condensed and became thicker, and now we have fully see, um, being able to see the chromosomes um, the nucleolus and the nuclear membrane will be gone by the end of prophase. They disappear, and then your spindle fiber will start to appear. And the centrioles will start moving toward opposite poles. And then you have metaphase. In metaphase, the chromosomes are lined up at the middle, and the spindle fibers are going right through the centromere. In anaphase, the chromosomes, or the sister chromatids, are splitting to become individual chromatids. They're moving toward the poles. The spindle fibers are contracting and shortening. And then in telophase, the chromatids will decondense to become chromatin eventually. And the nuclear membrane and nucleolus will return eventually. And remember that telophase overlaps with cytokinesis. All right, next topic is the differences between mitosis and meiosis. So in mitosis, we have individual chromosomes um, when you see them in prophase. In meiosis, you will see them in pairs called homologous chromosomes. You have one of mom's and one of dad's chromosomes, and they line up in pairs. Um, in mitosis, the first cell is has 46 chromosomes in it, and at the end, the new cells also have 46 chromosomes in them. But in meiosis, we start with 46 chromosomes, and the number gets cut in half, where at the end, we will only have 23 chromosomes in those cells that result. In mitosis, the cells that do mitosis are called body cells, and we call that also somatic cells, where in meiosis, they're germ cells that go through that process, and those germ cells are found in the ovaries and testes. Um, they are diploid. They have 46 chromosomes. Um, at the end of mitosis, we have identical, two identical daughter cells, and in meiosis, we have four non-identical gametes or sex cells. These are your, you're going to end up with four sperm if it's male, or you'll end up with one egg and three polar bodies. And remember, the polar bodies die because they're not big enough and they don't get enough nutrients. So overall in mitosis, there's four phases, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. And then in meiosis, it is prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase 1. And then it got cut off, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase 2. And remember, there is a cytokinesis in both of those. All right, next thing you need to study are the characteristics of meiosis 1 and meiosis 2, the two divisions. Um, I just put the main characteristics on here. Um, in meiosis 1, remember, the main phase that you want to remember is prophase 1 because that is when crossing over takes place. Remember the two homologous chromosomes, they swap their genes between mom and dad, and that creates genetic diversity. And then in metaphase 1, the pairs are lined up, so your pairs are like that in a, in a line, and then anaphase 1, the left chromosomes will go to the left, the right chromosomes will go to the right to the poles. Um, and then in telophase 1, you'll have, it, it'll just be individual chromosomes, and at that point, we have half the number of chromosomes at that point. Uh, meiosis 2 is just like mitosis. 
Um, the only difference is the chromosomes are mixed up genes, and the end is different, obviously. You're going to have four cells resulting with half the number of chromosomes as the original cell, and each of those four gametes, um, either whether they're sperm or eggs, are different from the original cell. All right, next thing is to know what crossing over is, when does it happen, and what is chiasmata. Crossing over is a mixing of those genes where the two chromatids swap over and they break off and the genes get mixed from mom and dad's um, chromosomes, the homologous chromosomes. It occurs in prophase one of meiosis, remember that, and the chiasmata is just the spot where it breaks off. All right, chapter seven review, bullet six, know the five parts to the cell cycle. So the um, there's five parts. One is here, it is G1 where the cell is growing. Two is the S phase where the DNA is being replicated along with other cell materials. Three is G2, which is preparation, maybe a little bit more growth, but mainly preparation for cell division. Four is mitosis, which breaks down to prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. Remember, mitosis is the division of the nucleus, that's the definition. And then the fifth part to the cell cycle is cytokinesis, which is when you have to divide the cytoplasm up so we will have new, completely separated cells. All right, we know what happens during cytokinesis for a plant and animal cell. So first for plant, you can see in the picture that we have to make a new cell wall between those two plant cells. In order to do that, we have to make a cell plate. A cell plate is just a bunch of cellulose that's going to be um, put in there. You don't need to know the details. But a cell plate will form, and then that will eventually become a new cell wall. For an animal, they don't have a cell wall, so they have cell membranes that we're going to need to pinch apart. So during telophase, remember it overlaps with telophase, the membrane pinches in, forming a cleavage furrow, which eventually will pinch all the way and result in those two separate cells. All right, two terms that you need to know is diploid and haploid, and which cells are which. So the diploid cells, when we're talking about diploid, that means that they have 46 chromosomes, 23 from mom, 23 from dad. The cells that have that are called body cells or somatic cells. So it's basically every cell in the body except for the reproductive cells. Um, and we abbreviate it 2N because they have twice the number of chromosomes, meaning they have two copies of them. The haploid cells are different. Those are your sex cells, your gametes, your sperm, and your eggs, and they only have half the number of chromosomes. They only have 23 chromosomes in them. And so their abbreviation is 1N. All right, last bullet. Um, on your exam, there will be a picture of one of the phases. It could be mitosis. It could be meiosis. And you need to, um, it's, but it's multiple choice, you will need to figure out what phase it is. So if you would like, um, I gave you two pictures. One is mitosis. One is meiosis. And you can go through, and for the green ones on the left, you can tell me what phase 1 through 6 are. And on the right, you can tell me what A through H are. So do that on, on the side in a scrap piece of paper. And then when you go to the next slide, your answers will be there. So you can see if you know them or not. So here are your answers. One was early telophase, two interphase, three prophase, four late telophase, five anaphase, six metaphase. All of the green ones were mitosis. On the right, the A through H pictures, those were all meiosis. And they're actually in order. Um, a was prophase 1, B metaphase 1, C anaphase 1, D telophase 1, E prophase 2, F metaphase 2, G anaphase 2, H telophase 2. All right, one of the short answers is from our lab. Calculate the percentage of cells in each phase of mitosis given the data. So here is some sample data. So let's say, you remember you had three fields of view. You guys did one field of view, and then you got the data from two other groups. And in your field of view, you got 35 for interphase, 11 for prophase, 2 for metaphase, 3 for anaphase, 2 for telophase, etc. And then you have the numbers for field 2 and field 3. You're going to want to total those up so you have a total number of cells that were seen in each of those phases and then get a completely total number of cells counted. And so the question for the short answer is going to be what is the percent of total cells counted for each of those phases? So you will need to know how to do that. So basically, you're going to take 162 and divide it by 219, and then that answer will go there as a percent. And the next one would be 38 divided by 219, and then that answer would go for your second row. So the answers are on the next slide. So if you did it correctly, interphase, you should have got 73.9%. 
Prophase 17.3%, metaphase about 3.6%, anaphase 2.2%, telophase about 2.74%. All right, moving on to Chapter 8. Why did Mendel choose the pea? Um, they were small. They were easy to grow. They produce many offspring. There's many varieties or traits that you can see with the pea. They mature quickly. And the biggest one is that they're easy to pollinate or fertilize. They can be self-pollinated or cross-pollinated. Um, um, and you can control that. Mendel could control that. He can control whether he wanted to self-pollinate or cross-pollinate them. And the cool thing about peas um, and a lot of other plants, but... Um, for peas is that they can be true breeding and that's what he did for his parent offspring his parents was he made them true breeding which means they were homozygous and they can only produce the same type of offspring so Mendel had a famous experiment make sure you understand his three steps to his parent um, for his experiments the first step was to produce the parent generation remember he wanted them to be true breeding so he had a pure purple and a pure white plant he did that by um, self-pollinating them and then he produced the F1 generation by crossing them so he took a purple plant and a white plant and he cross fertilized them um, and his results were all purple in the F1 generation which we know now no we know now that they were dominant they were actually heterozygous so like they were like big T little T so they weren't expressing that white gene um, and then third step was to produce the F2 generation so he self-pollinated these guys, and he ended up with a 3 to 1 ratio, where three of them were dominant and one of them was recessive. One term from the Jeopardy was a test cross. A test cross is a method designed to figure out whether a dominant trait that an organism has is homozygous dominant or is it heterozygous dominant. And so in order to do that, this is a process, and it entails taking the questionable organism and mating it with a recessive organism. And so when you do that, you will see the results. If it was homozygous, then all the offspring would be big T, little t. If the main offspring was heterozygous dominant, then you would get a 50-50. Um, you would see that recessive in their offspring. So that is a way to figure out whether it's homozygous or heterozygous dominant. All right, make sure that you can do a basic monohybrid cross. For, and then be able to give me a phenotype ratio for the end. There is a two there on the study guide, so I'm assuming there's two questions on this. So you have your genetic problem notes and you have your genetic problem packet that was graded. So make sure that you can do a basic problem, a four square, it's called a monohybrid problem. Um, it is a multiple choice, so if you can do it in your head or you can just do the little cross on the side of your test and, um, and do it that way, but it will, you will have four, four or five choices for your multiple choice. So there's an example there that you can see. All right, so the next type of problem that will be on the test is a dihybrid problem. It's going to ask you for just to figure out what are the genotypes of the parents. So again, review your notes on dihybrids. Review your genetic problem packet that was graded for the dihybrid problems. It is a multiple choice question, um, so no official work will need to be shown. You just need to figure out what's the genotypes of the parents. So I gave you an example. If a tall green pea plant is crossed with a short white pea plant, um, then you need to figure out, well, what are the genotypes of those parents? If, I, if you know what's dominant and recessive, then you should be able to um, figure that out. All right, next concept are sex chromosomes versus autosomes. Um, I gave you a picture of a karyotype there. The sex chromosomes are just the ones that are on the, the last pair, the 23rd pair. Remember, if they match, they are XX, and that determines the organism is female. And if it's XY and they do not match, as in this case, then it is male. So sex chromosomes determine the sex of the organism. Um, autosomes are all the other chromosomes. So there's 22 pairs of chromosomes that are autosomes. They do not determine the sex. They determine all the other traits. All right, so the next genetic problem that will be on your test is a sex-linked problem. It's going to ask you for phenotype after you do the cross, so you will have to do with the Punnett square. Um, so please review your sex-linked genetic problem notes and your sex-linked problems packet that was graded. Um, it is a multiple-choice question, so you can do a Punnett square on the side and then pick from your choices. Remember, for sex-linked problems, you are using X's and Y's, um, XX for girl, XY for boy, and then you, all your X's need to have a letter attached to them. 
Um, if they're carriers, they're heterozygous, you would have X big B, X little b. If the dad had the disease, then if it's recessive, he would be X little by. And in this case, for this example, he did not have it, so he is X big B y. So be sure to be able to do this type of problem. All right, there are um, a couple problems of pedigrees. A pedigree will be given to you, just like in Jeopardy, and then you need to choose and figure out what the shaded in is representing. Is it representing an autosomal trait or a sex link trait? And then is it representing recessive or dominant? So you have examples of all of these in your notes. Please look at those. They give you hints on how to figure it out. All right, one of your short answer problems is doing a genetic problem, and in this case it is going to be a dihybrid, a 16-square problem. Um, so please look over your notes again and make sure you know how to do a dihybrid problem. You're going to be doing it full out, showing all your work, and doing genotype and phenotype percents for the offspring that are expected. Um, so just remember, as soon as you figure out the genotypes of your parents, you need to do FOIL, and your FOIL answers will go on the top and on the left of your Punnett square. And then also remember that you should only be using two letters, and then you should have four letters in your genotypes for your offspring for inside the boxes. All right, last chapter is the recent stuff. This is your DNA um, for bullet one. You need to know your scientists. Not all the scientists are on the test. These are the four scientists that make sure you um, review and know. Is Rosalind Franklin, Wilkins, Watson, and Crick. Make sure you understand Chargaff's rules. I have a typo on here. I just noticed that C equals G and G equals C, and then A equals T and T equals A. All right, for bullet three, make sure you understand the term anti-parallel. So when you look at the picture, you can see the DNA there, and you can see the five prime, the three prime ends, and if you look on the other side of the DNA molecule, it is opposite. The two strands of DNA run in opposite directions. That's what anti-parallel means. So DNA is anti-parallel because they run in opposite directions. So for example, if one strand from left to right ran from five prime to three prime, then the other strand from left to right runs the opposite, three prime to five prime. All right, next um, review question is what elements are in DNA? And so if you think of a nucleotide, um, you would have carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, um, you have a nitrogen base in there, right? The A, C, T, and G, those have nitrogen in it. And then you also have a phosphate group on the, on the outside of the DNA. So you have carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, and phosphorus. All right, next bullet talks about the chemical bonds that are in DNA. Remember, every single bond that's in DNA is going to be a covalent bond. So all of these, all of these lines are all covalent bonds. Those are strong covalent bonds. It keeps the order of the DNA intact so that will, you will not lose that. The only bond that is not covalent is the one between the nitrogen bases. That is a hydrogen bond. It is a weak bond compared to a covalent bond so that that bond can be broken when the DNA needs to unzip to replicate. Make sure that you can do the complementary side of DNA. A letter sequence will be given to you, given the 5 prime and the 3 prime, and you need to give me the other side. It was just like in the Jeopardy. So if the one side reads 5 prime, T A C G A T C A T A T, 3 prime, then the complementary side would be, and this is going to be multiple choice, 3 prime, A T G C T A G T A T A, 5 prime. Next bullet is understanding the three different ways the DNA could replicate. They did an experiment on these. And the one that is true is called semi-conservatives. Make sure you know that term. And that means that when DNA replicates, you get one old strand and one new strand. All right, next one is can you number a sugar and understand what is bonded to those numbers? So carbon number one is always going to be, this one right here, is always going to be bonded to your nitrogen base, A, C, T, or G. Um, carbon 2 isn't bonded to anything. Carbon 3 and carbon 5 are bonded to phosphates. All right, next thing is understanding DNA replication. You have an enzyme that's unzipping this DNA molecule. You have a leading strand up here, and you have a lagging strand down here. 
And then you can see the DNA is being made in opposite directions. The leading strand is the, D the new DNA side is being replicated going toward the fork. It's growing in a 5' prime to 3' prime direction. The lagging strand is, has to go in that same direction. It has to grow in that way. So it has to go away from the fork, which means we get these gaps, the Okazaki fragments, which will need to be sealed up. You should also know your enzymes. These are the, there's more enzymes in your notes. These are the three that are on the test. So you should know what DNA polymerase does, which it adds nucleotides to the growing strand. It also repairs and fixes any mistakes. DNA ligase is the one that seals all those fragments up, called the Okazaki fragments. And you have DNA helicase, which is, that's the enzyme that unzips the DNA. All right, on your short answer, there will be three diagrams. One diagram is DNA that's double-stranded. Um, you will have to label two things. So there's two things pointing to it. It could be a bond. It could be what letter is it. It could be a part. Is it a nitrogen base? Is it a sugar? Is it a phosphate? So you make sure you understand the structure of DNA. Your second diagram is DNA replication that you'll have to label. So are you labeling the leading strand, the lagging strand? Maybe you're labeling the helicase. Maybe you're labeling the Okazaki fragment, something like that. And then your third diagram is on transcription, when RNA is made. So maybe you're labeling the promoter, you're labeling the 5' prime end, the 3' prime end, RNA polymerase, something like that. So review those diagrams in your notes, um, and just be aware that there is no word bank. Um, over this year, we've done a few times the standard deviation in our labs. So it is on our test this time. Um, so you're going to need to be able to do a simple standard deviation problem. Well, you'll be given a small sample set, and you'll need to um, run through the standard deviation. Um, you, will, you can show any work you want, but I'm looking for a final correct answer. You're not graded on your work at all. I'm just looking for a final answer. So remember, your equation there will be on the formula sheet. You're taking your sample, and you're taking each of your numbers and m subtracting the mean from that. So you got to get the average of your numbers. In this case, in this example, the mean was 16. So you're taking each of your sample data numbers and subtracting 16 from it. So 10 minus 16 squared, and you have to square it, 12 minus 16 squared, 14 minus 16 squared, etc., etc. You keep doing that. You figure all that top part out, and then you divide by n minus 1. n is how many samples do you have. Um, in this case, there are 8 samples. So 8 minus 1, that's why they're dividing by 7. And then once you get the inside done, you take the square root, and that is your standard deviation. Another short answer problem is to create a chromosome map. You should have got this worksheet back. Um, they're going to give you the numbers, and you have to figure out the sequence of the genes and label it with the um, numbers between them. All right, and then lastly, you will have an essay. I gave you four choices. One of those choices are on the exam, so I would. Genius idea would be to prepare for all four. That way... You're ready for whatever which one it will be on there. All right, so the test is on Monday. Be ready. There's nothing due. You're just taking your test, and there will be no homework. Good luck.